So it's a big pleasure to have with us today for the uh, GGI Tea Break Seminar, Johanna Ertmenger. Johanna is a full professor uh, for theoretical physics uh, at the University of Würzburg. And um, she um, obtained her PhD in Cambridge. Uh, and then afterwards she worked uh, something about her, her bio and uh, afterwards she worked in Leipzig uh, and at MIT as a postdoc and then she was leading a, a junior research uh, group uh, at Humboldt University in Berlin um, to move then uh, to Munich uh, where she also led a group at the Max Planck Institute for Physique for Physics uh, and uh, she was also professor at LMU but then she moves uh, to have this chair at Würzburg. And she's, uh, uh, I would say she's known uh, in ADSCFT also because uh, she wrote uh, um, an important book on the correspondence. And she and ADSCFT, so the gauge uh, string theory duality is uh, at the center of her research. Also in her talk today, she worked on many applications and also many formal aspects, uh, both of which will be the argument uh, of the seminar today. And so I'm um, happy to let you have her uh, uh, speak. And thanks for uh, uh, accepting our invitation, Johanna. Yes, thank you very much, Valentina, for the very kind introduction for having me and to all the organizing team for inviting me. It's a very great pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, so here you can see the castle in Würzburg. If you have not been there, it's definitely a place which is worth visiting. <laughs> Um, and my talk is about very famous factorization in wormholes in ADS-CFT. Um, uh, no, I can't, uh, okay, yeah, okay. Let me, um, so, so maybe I should say one thing, so I understand, so it's called tea break, so it's a colloquium. Uh, the talk will be very colloquium style, but also since it's a tea break, I, I think that the idea is to have some discussion, so I, I would be extremely happy to take uh, questions already during the talk, so please make yourself known by probably by raising the hand if you would like to, to ask a question during the talk, I would be very happy about this. And uh, so let me begin with some, some motivation of what I'm going to tell you. So uh, the talk essentially is going to be about the relation between entanglement and uh, geometry that is provided by the ADS-CFT correspondence. And in this context, uh, wormholes provide an important relation that I will introduce to you, uh, which uh, is the subject of research of a very large community of people. And so I just mentioned a few people here on the slide. Um, so what I'm going to tell to you today and making this connection to some other fields of physics is that uh, the concept of a wormhole is also present in uh, simple quantum mechanics models. And the way this um, um, arises uh, will actually be uh, a center part of this talk. And uh, so here, the, the very phase comes in and provides, uh, plays a crucial role in providing an understanding of how the degrees of freedom entangle to give the whole full Hilbert space in such a quantum mechanics system. And uh, a concept that I will also explain to you, which is very central to this uh, whole uh, field, is the concept of factorization. And so this really means the factorization of the Hilbert space. So if there's entangling between different degrees of freedom, say you have one spin and another spin, then uh, the question arises whether um, the Hilbert space that um, is spent or the, the state in which these um, entangled uh, spins are in actually is in a factorized or a non-factorized Hilbert space. And um, so, so this plays a very crucial role to for drawing this analogy between quantum mechanics and uh, wormholes that I'm about to show to you. So I will discuss this concept in quite some detail. Okay, so that, this brings me to the overview of this talk. So um, I'm going to explain to you uh, what wormholes and factorization are, in particular in the context of the ADS-CFT correspondence. Um, I will then come to some particular realizations of the Berry phase in quantum mechanics. And um, on the uh, other side of the correspondence, um, I, I will then uh, look at two-dimensional conformal field theories and uh, their gravity dual. So that makes three parts to the talk, uh, which I will present to you. Okay, before I enter the details, let me tell you that this is based on some recent research of our group. Uh, so I should name my collaborator, Rene Meyer, and my students, 
Um, Moritz Dorband and Anna Lena Weigel, and also my collaborator, uh, Srovic Banerjee. And I should also mention that uh, for the first project, uh, we teamed up with our colleagues, Flavio Nogera and Jeroen van den Brink, who are actually condensed matter physicists in Dresden. And so this is a joint project in the so-called excellence cluster complexity and topology in quantum matter. So this is a large scale research grant given actually by the federal German government. And uh, so there's like a couple of these and uh, within Germany, I think 57. And one of them is devoted to um, um, quantum matter and involves researchers in both Würzburg and Dresden. And so this uh, actually sparked this um, collaboration between us from the ADSC side, SCFT side and our colleagues uh, in, in the Institute for Material Science in Dresden. So it's actually a very nice example for quite interdisciplinary collaboration. And uh, so the second uh, paper is, um, so while this paper is about quantum mechanics, the second is more about in one dimension higher about conformal field theories. And um, so this paper is really about realizing some topological aspects within quantum mechanics, whereas here we, we really enter the details of the ADS-CFT correspondence. And both of these will enter various places of, of my talk. Okay, so uh, as I said, my talk has three parts. So let me begin with the first one, which is about black holes and wormholes and um, ADS-CFT and the factorization um, puzzle. All right, um, I see many people in the audience who are familiar with ADS-CFT, but I also see many people who are maybe not that familiar with ADS-CFT. So I, I would like to ask the holographers to be a little patient with me because it's a colloquium. So I will give a little bit of overview and detail about what the ADS-CFT correspondence is because it's so crucial for, for this talk, of course. So as proposed by Maldasena now already 25 years ago, but so this is really one of the decisive developments in theoretical physics over the last quarter century, um, is that he proposed that gravity in uh, D plus one dimensional hyperbolic anti visitor space is mapped to a strongly coupled conformal field theory in one dimension less that is located at its boundary. So here I have drawn off uh, uh, the case where uh, D is actually equal to two. So we have a three dimensional anti visitor space. And uh, so here you see cuts at uh, constant uh, time. And so there's this nice figure by Escher here, uh, which demonstrates that. Uh, so this is a projection on a plane at constant time, and then this um, demonstrates this hyperbolic structure because these angels and devils, they all have the same area, but the ones in the middle look much bigger than the ones at the boundary. Um, then an important concept here is, of course, the radial direction in this anti visitor space, and uh, the CFT is, can be thought of as living at the two-dimensional boundary, uh, which is also spanned by this variable phi, which we have in addition. Um, so it's a crucial aspect that in some particular limit, uh, the, the field theory that is involved is actually strongly coupled. And uh, so that normally plays a central role in the ADS-CFT correspondence, but as I'm going to argue today, there are some topological aspects of um, geometry in this uh, gravity space and uh, in the conformal field theory or quantum mechanics model at the boundary in such a way that um, um, we can actually uh, claim to make statements beyond this uh, strongly coupled limit, uh, because we are essentially talking about the topology of particular objects. Um, another important concept I need to introduce is the concept of a black hole inside the ADS space. So, and that was, uh, was found um, quite soon after the original proposal, um, it is a black hole inside this anti visitor space is dual to a field theory um, at finite temperature. So this means if we put a black hole inside our anti visitor space, um, then um, actually for those of you who have not seen this, I have put the metric here and um, um, this is also conveniently looked at in Euclidean space. So we have changed the, the sign um, here of this dt uh, squared term. Um, so there's now actually a horizon appearing here. And so the horizon is when the radial coordinate is equal to one. And then of course you see that there's a degeneracy here in, in the metric. 
And um, so, so and that's uh, actually the origin of this, this horizon in these Schwarzschild coordinates that I have used here. And um, just to tell you very quickly where the temperature comes from, um, close to this uh, boundary, it's actually very good to um, um, expand around the horizon. And uh, then we see that the space is only regular if this uh, Euclidean time tor is periodic in such a way and where actually the, the radius of the period is given by the inverse temperature. And so that, uh, and that very naturally introduces the concepts of temperature uh, and uh, all this formalism of finite temperature field theory like Matsubara frequencies and so on. So, so um, it's a very natural idea that this black hole is actually related to a finite temperature field theory. Okay, so, but for the talk today, uh, I'm going to consider a slightly different setup, um, which is a little more complicated in the sense that it will be a kind of double version of this. So um, what is drawn here is the so-called Poincaré patch. So it covers half of uh, such a hyperbolic space. And today we are going to look at um, uh, global coordinates or the so-called Kruskal coordinates where we consider actually uh, the entire cover of uh, hyperboloid. And um, this means uh, that in addition of just having one boundary and uh, one internal radial direction here, so we will actually actually have two copies. So you can think of the upper half of being one version of the um, drawing on the previous slide and the other, uh, the lower half here on the left-hand side as another copy. So we have one conformal field theory on the left-hand side and another conformal field theory at the right-hand side. And uh, time is going actually in this direction for the right-hand CFT and in that direction for the left-hand CFT. And then this horizon, which appeared here in this picture, um, corresponds to this line that you can see here. And um, so there's actually a future singularity and a past singularity uh, as seen from an observer on the side. Okay, so we have this double structure that uh, becomes obvious in the Kruskal coordinates. And actually now, um, if we put a black hole into this um, global anti sitter space, then we get a so-called eternal ADS black hole. Um, so, and this corresponds to a so-called non-traversable wormhole. So you could imagine that an observer from here goes into, uh, falls into the black hole from this side and the same happens from, from that side and then they can meet here in the middle. Um, however, because um, in this scenario, energy is conserved, it's not actually possible to enter here and exit on the other side again. And then that's why it's called a non-traversable wormhole. Um, it's, uh, ah, there's a question. Yes, please ask a question. Sundata, can you go ahead? Ah, sorry, uh, ask to unmute, so I should unmute. Okay. So can you hear me? Yes. So uh, my question is, uh, how do you interpret the right left-hand side of the diagram here in terms of the previous diagram that you had on the previous slide, I mean, what does the horizon and the region on the left hand side be represented by in the previous diagram in, the, in terms of the HR diagrams? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good question. So, um, so you should compare with this diagram. And uh, so here we have the Schwarzschild coordinates and here I've moved to the Kruskal, which I'm not showing to you, unfortunately. And essentially, so um, here the right hand side, okay, um, would correspond to the outer side of this uh, cylinder here. Okay, and then the radial direction takes me to the black hole. So this, uh, from this point of view, so this would be um, the outside of the cylinder and then the radial direction goes into this direction and takes me to the black hole. So what is shown on the other side is the Poincaré patch, which is essentially this upper half here. And now I just glue it with another um, side, which is the left side, and that would correspond to the lower left half um, in here in this diagram. So this is the, a, a global cover of the hyperboloid, whereas the other one is just a local chart, if you want. Uh, so that's the relation between the two. So, but in both in the previous case and also here, um, there is actually a singularity in the time coordinate at the horizons on both sides. 
And uh, so actually the, the, the killing vector that generates time translations, the, the timeline killing vector uh, switches the sign at the, at the horizon. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Good, okay, so let me go on. So um, now where's the relation to entanglement? So already uh, quite some time ago, um, Juan Manuel Messina proposed that um, such an eternal black hole in ADS uh, space-time is dual to two copies of the boundary CFT, but with an addition uh, and particular entanglement structure. So, and uh, so he conjectured that the two CFTs are entangled in the so-called thermofluid double state. Okay, so this is now the same picture as I had on the previous slide in this crystal coordinates. Here's again our CFTs on the left and right, and here's the horizon. And this blue line here corresponds, for instance, to, to a kind of wisdom line or, or geodesic region from one side to the other, and uh, symbolizing the, the entanglement that we will have uh, between the two series on the two sides. Um, now, what is a thermofield double state? So this is a concept uh, from um, quantum many body physics. And um, so uh, if you want in the context of um, uh, quantum information, it's the purification of a thermal state of one of the CFTs. So assume that on the left-hand side, <coughs> there's a basis of the Hilbert space uh, of your quantum theory, which is given by these ends. And uh, then you, you consider a copy of the Hilbert space on the other side, the same basis. And then you define this state, which involves this thermal factor here and the partition function. And um, so then you create a pure state um, that, um, um, that is entangled. And so if you now trace over one of the two uh, quantum series, either on the left or the right hand side, so in this case, we trace over the right hand side, then um, we get, exactly get the thermal density matrix uh, on the other side. So essentially by, by copying the, the theory, um, we managed to purify the thermal state. And so we have a pure state uh, in such a way that if we trace over one part of it again, then we get a thermal density matrix for the other half. And, and uh, precisely the state um, was conjectured to um, the, the, if these, you know, these two theories symbolize this or in, are in the state, um, they are conjectured to be dual to um, this eternal black hole. Okay, so, and, and this can be pushed further in the so-called ER is equal to EPR proposal, um, um, pioneered by the authors given here. So, and this is a very important relation between entanglement and geometry. Um, so um, the slogan really means that um, on one hand side, we have uh, the, the Einstein and Podolsky Rosen entanglement. So if you remember in 1935, there was this famous paper by Einstein, Podolsky and uh, Rosen, um, which is about maximally ent entangled photons, which so Einstein considered this as a, being a kind of counter example to quantum mechanics, because he said if two entangled photons um, you know, fly in opposite directions, they should be able to transport information faster than light in this uh, country. And so, of course, um, this has a very big success story in the context of quantum optics, of course, where exactly this has been shown to be happening. And on the other side, um, there's also the so-called Einstein-Rosen bridge, which is actually a wormhole. Um, and so, and as these also uh, proposed, um, the two are actually related to each other within the ADS CFT correspondence. So two entangled CFTs entangled in the way that I just explained uh, with an einstein podolsky rosen correlation. So they are maximally entangled, the two, uh, the two CFTs on the two sides of this, uh, of this diagram, left and right. Um, they are, can, can be considered in the dual gravity picture to be connected through a, a wormhole, which is this einstein rosen bridge. Okay, so we have our two uh, uh, CFDs on the two sides uh, in this um, uh, thermofield double state and the dual geometry is this, this um, eternal um, black hole which corresponds to a wormhole. And here the blue and red lines are again Wilson lines which show the connection between the two boundaries. So there's another question, I think. Nobody asking a question? Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. so so does it have to be maximally entangled or like you can 
or, or you can have like some other amount of entanglement. Uh, okay, very good question. I, I think in, in, in this um, um, approach, I mean, what I've seen, been saying so far, it, it's maximally entangled, but I don't think this is absolutely necessary. We will actually, this is a good question because in the examples I'm going to discuss later, there's also some other possibilities for entanglement. Um, so, you know, I, I would say in, no, in all generality, it's not necessarily maximally entangled. Yeah, okay, thank you. Good question. Yeah, I will come back to that actually. Okay, but the fact that we have entanglement between the two sides now rises this uh, factorization puzzle. <laughs> okay, so and the puzzle um, as proposed by these authors or raised by these authors is actually the following. So uh, we have two CFTs which are on the two sides of the wormholes. Um, so the, the wormhole and the wormhole is not traversable. So in principle, there's no interaction between these two CFTs. So they should have disjoint uh, Hilbert spaces. And so the total Hilbert space should just be a tensor product between the two sides. <clears throat> so um, um, on the other hand, if we look at the semi-classical uh, Hilbert space that we can uh, write down for the wormhole, so this is um, as depicted here by these Wilson lines traversing the wormhole. Um, so that actually does not factorize. So now, but if we say that there's, there's a duality between these two um, uh, statements, um, between the entangled CFTs and the wormhole geometry, uh, then of course the Hilbert space should have the same structure. And uh, how can it be that in one case it factorizes and in the other it doesn't? So there's an apparent contradiction. And um, I will say something about this contradiction in the, in the course of the talk. Okay, so an important point which now uh, enters here is um, this work by Hermann Verlinde from last year, who actually um, made uh, some proposal about this factorization properties for wormholes in, in quantum mechanics. And uh, so um, actually there's now a kind of generalized concept of a wormhole, which has a very similar mathematical structure to the wormhole that I just showed you in the anti sitter space. Um, so in quantum mechanics, we have a partition function uh, that takes the swarm with HD Hamiltonian. And now if we make use of um, some theorems of um, classical mechanics, um, we can introduce uh, generalized coordinates and momenta and introduce a phase space on which we can define a symplectic form, which is given here. Um, and then the partition function uh, that we have to evaluate is actually a partition function on this entire disk where uh, we integrate over the phase space. And here's an integral over the symplectic form. And then there's another uh, integral over the boundary with the Hamiltonian here. Now, if the symplectic structure, which is this two form here, um, is exact, which means that we can write it as an exterior derivative of another form, then uh, by Stokes theorem, we can uh, trade this integral for an integral over the boundary. And uh, then indeed uh, our original partition function is equal to this uh, disk partition function. Um, however, if the symplectic structure is non-exact, okay, so if there's some point where this relation doesn't hold, then um, actually um, we, we cannot use Stokes theorem. And uh, so we have to integrate over the entire disk. And so that means if we now have uh, several, a wormhole with several ends, not just two, but maybe four as shown here, then actually uh, our, our um, integral or integration region is this entire region, which already looks very much like a wormhole rather than integrating over each of these thermal circles individually. Okay, so <clears throat> the fact that um, there's this non-exactness of the symplectic form already it's very similar to the uh, topological structure of the wormhole um, that um, we have somebody's asking what is d d is just uh, the area of this disk okay oh sorry i clicked on the wrong okay uh, no i don't you know what i didn't do yeah sorry okay um d is just um okay so this disk so here, the circle here is just the thermal circle with, uh, with this radius given by the inverse temperature. <clears throat> um, 
Um, but um, you know, if the if the subjective form is not exact, we don't just have to integrate along the circle, but we have to in integrate over this entire surface here. Okay, so this is the statement. Um, this is made that this made in this paper actually. Um, well, uh, physically, what is D? Okay, so um, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, okay, so here I haven't specified exactly. Uh, uh, what 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 a mechanical example I'm going to talk about, but um, I think this is a very good question because it leads me to a particular example I want to show to you. Okay, and in this example we will see much more clearer. I mean here, okay, so so H is some general Hamiltonian, and this is some general non-subjective form. And uh, to show what the physics is, I, I will move to to the next um, to the, to a particular example. Okay. Good. So that brings me to the second part of my talk. So I'm now going to talk about Berry phases in quantum mechanics. So uh, Berry phase is a topological um, mathematical concept that will be very useful to um, um, characterize this symplectic form. And actually, it's uh, intimately re related to the symplectic form by an integral. And um, so now I'm going to draw, show you an example in quantum mechanics. And uh, uh, we will see but in precisely uh, what, what we, how we can interpret this geometric structure. I mean, that's exactly the idea of, of what I want to show to you. Okay, so uh, we will do something extremely simple. So rather than looking at something complicated in, in ADS-CFT, we'll just take a two qubit system, so two spins. So this could be two electrons or two photons, say. I mean, um, okay, I, I think uh, in this example we had electrons in mind, but it's very easy to transfer this to, to photons as well. So uh, I'm going to show you the Berry phase for an interacting two qubit system in quantum mechanics. And so what we are going to see is that states with the same entanglement may nevertheless have a different Berry phase. And um, so this Berry phase will be mathematically described by a non exact symplectic form, as I just introduced. And this non-exact symplectic form will be a sign of the non-factorization of the Hilbert space. Okay, and that's precisely this mathematical structure that's shared by the wormholes. And so this means what we can do is to realize some mathematical property of wormholes, some abstract mathematical property of wormholes in, in the context of some extremely simple quantum mechanical system. And so what I would really like to see, um, and I'm quite optimistic about this, that this can actually be realized experimentally. So, I mean, I should be cautious. I mean, there's no experiment yet uh, doing exactly what I'm going to show to you, but uh, it is very close uh, to um, various experimental techniques that are around. And so um, I'm very confident that this can actually happen. I will discuss this a little bit further on. Okay, um, since I'm not entirely sure if everybody knows what the Berry phase is, let me uh, very quickly introduce it to you in the particular context that we are going to consider. And I'm basing myself here on these lectures by David Tong, which is a very nice review, and the picture is also taken actually from these lecture notes. Okay, so we are in quantum mechanics, so we consider the Schrodinger equation and um, so the Hamiltonian uh, should uh, depend on some um, parameter lambda, or there could be several of them labeled by lambda by an i index, for instance, and um, and and these parameters depend on time. So um, then the, we can write the ground state of our um, of our Hamiltonian of of, of the system of the quantum mechanical system um, as some. Um, Evolution operator actually acting on some basis which also depends on, on this parameter lambda. And then um, the Berry connection is a connection in the mathematical sense, which depends on these parameters, and is actually um, the derivative of uh, these states with respect to the parameter. And so inserting this into um, the, the Schrödinger equation gives us this relation for this uh, operator U of t here. And then uh, the Berry phase is defined as the, the contour integral um, over these um, uh, parameter, parameters lambda, um, as you can see here. Um, so as just to illustrate, um, here I have shown um, the Berry phase for just one 
particle, okay, so there's no entanglement involved yet. So just one particle in the magnetic field. And um, in that case, actually, um, you can see that this will be related to um, a monopole that is inside the uh, space spanned by the magnetic field. So it's not a monopole in real space, it's a monopole in the uh, this magnetic field space. And then, uh, so the contour, for instance, can be uh, taken and on the line uh, shown here. And, it, and so here we will have this uh, singularity, which leads to this non-symplectic, um, uh, the non-exactness of the symplectic form. And that will be very crucial for giving a uh, non-zero result in this integral here. Okay, so the model we considered in our paper uh, corresponds to two coupled spins in, in, in an external magnetic field. So uh, you could imagine that it describes the electronic Zeeman interaction in the hydrogen atom, where we only take really the Bohr magnetism of the electron uh, into account and ignore the um, interaction of the proton with the magnetic field. And then the Hamiltonian has one term that couples the two spins, the spin of the electron and um, uh, the, um, the proton. And uh, then one of the spins, say the electron, also interacts with the magnetic field. Okay, so it's really a, uh, we have a hydrogen atom in the uh, magnetic field and just consider how the electron interacts with this magnetic field. Okay, so now uh, we look at particular symmetries that we have here and that we may use. So here actually in this Hamiltonian, I have chosen the magnetic field to be pro parallel to, to this spin. And, uh, but of course, in general, we could also have a, a vector interaction here. But then uh, we, we, we can just take a particular unitary transformation of one of the spins of the spin one. Uh, that takes us back uh, to this original Zeeman term that we had in our original Hamiltonian. And um, so this unitary transformation uh, then depends on two angles theta and phi and uh, takes this form here. And because now we have a north and a south pole, if you want, in our uh, spin manifold, there's actually two patches and where this third angle psi in one patch is uh, identified with phi and in the other one it's uh, identified with minus phi. Okay, so and this transformation takes us back to this Hamiltonian that we started with and aligns the one of the spins with the magnetic field. Now, uh, since the second spin does not interact with the magnetic field, we can choose any, um, any um, unitary transformation to act on it, and that will be a symmetry of the problem. And so we just choose uh, a unitary transformation to act on the second spin, uh, where there's a parameter lambda entering here, and we choose lambda to lie between zero and one, and then we consider a unitary transformation that is the tensor product of these two rotations, uh, unitary transformations acting on the one spin and the other. Okay, so I see that where this lambda is a, okay, I should be a little careful because um, it's a, this is a different lambda than uh, I had before. So uh, here the lambda is a uh, parameter that is affected by, um, um, by the dynamics, but here this lambda is a slightly different lambda, so it's just a parameter that I choose in this unitary transformation. Okay, maybe the name is a bit unfortunate that it's so similar. Okay, so lambda is really defined as is a choice for, for my angles in this transformation for on the second spin. Okay, now uh, we consider the ground state of our um, model. And uh, so um, since we have two spins, uh, we have singlet and triplet states and so we write the, the ground state in the standard notation with the two quantum numbers. And um, so, and then actually what we find is that the ground state of the system looks like this. And uh, so there's a, a, an angle alpha here, which uh, actually encodes the parameters, which are the magnetic field and um, the coupling strength. So B and J uh, are here and there. Okay, there was another question. Yes. Okay, so my question is, uh, if, the, if the two spins are entangled, mm -hmm. how can we transform one without transforming the other by the exactly the same amount without uh, uh, violating angular momentum conservation? 
uh, I think I can. I mean, this is just the first transformation in the spin of, of my Hamiltonian. Okay, I'm just transforming the spin, the operators in the Hamiltonian, and 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 this transformation uh, preserves the symmetry of the problem. Um, that's what I'm claiming. So, and then um, you know you, you can just calculate. I mean, the, the ground state, and, and in fact, as you can show. Um, when is that that the entanglement entropy? So, so you know, if, if this is your ground state and um, um, you, you can calculate the von Neumann entropy of this partial trace, it will be actually unchanged under applying this particular transformation. And uh, so, then um, we, it's actually possible to show that the entanglement entropy uh, will look like this just by uh, explicit calculation with this parameter alpha defined by this equation here and it's independent of this uh, symmetry transformation view um okay I, you know i think we have to be very careful i mean this is already one important point that we have here we have the entanglement and we have the interaction with the magnetic field and these are two independent things and actually the very phase that i'm going to consider is there going to be a very phase with respect to the magnetic field okay um and and then okay so this is something to keep in mind actually so we have a very phase with respect to the magnetic field so if we switch off this magnetic field then the very phase is just zero okay okay so the very phase and here we can use make use of some uh, beautiful mathematics and uh, de define it in this um, uh, rather mathematical way so um we uh, start with the so-called Maurer Cartan form, which is a connection on a group manifold M, which is defined for any group element sigma of this group uh, manifold. And uh, so here's our connection that is defined in this, this standard way. And um, so then the Barry connection in, for this quantum mechanical model will be the ground state expectation value of precisely this Maurer Cartan form. Now we take our ground state and uh, our symmetries uh, that we introduced for this particular model that I showed to you, and then we just plug everything in and we calculate, and then we get this expression here, which depends on alpha. So alpha just encodes, sorry, just encodes the magnetic field strengths and the coupling strengths. Okay, let me here was J and, and here. Um, but then uh, it also depends on the angle of theta on phi on our spin manifold. But then there's also this parameter lambda um, that enters our uh, transformation that we have chosen. Okay, so this means that our results will depend on lambda. And so the Berry curvature then um, just then comes from the so-called uh, Berry connection, which is the exterior derivative of the smaller Cartan form, which is, goes also under the name of Kirillus constant, the symplectic form. And uh, so here, this is this is the Berry curvature, and just again plugging everything in, we get this expression here. And the Berry phase is then given by the integral of our both theta and phi, which span our um, spin manifold. And uh, this is the result that we get. Okay, again, with this constant alpha, and then lambda is the parameter of this unitary transformation. Okay, here I just copied the same result one more time. And uh, so we actually see that this is non trivial as long as lambda is not equal to one. And this means if the two transformations are different from each other. So if I, if I rotate the two spin operators in exactly the parallel way, then I would get zero for the um, for the uh, Barry connection, but uh, if they, I rotate them in a different way, um, then then we get something non-zero, and that actually happens because we have this non-exact um, symplectic form, <coughs> and the Kirillov constant form in this particular case is not globally exact because it's actually proportional to the volume form on S two. Okay, and so we find uh, different states, the ground state and this transform state that have the same entanglement entropy, but different Berry phase. And that's exactly the, um, the point where I think that that would be something that could probably be found experimentally. And uh, let me just give a few hints for, for experiments. So um, of course, quantum tomography uh, as reviewed in this uh, seminal paper will be come here to, to great use. Um, so what, what is quantum tomography? So essentially the idea is to restruct, uh, reconstruct a quantum state um, using measurements on an ensemble of identical quantum states. 
and that then gives rise to the to the density matrix. And um, so again, for for a two qubit state, um, if we have some phase uh, here between um, the, this state zero zero and the state one one, then uh, measuring this tensor product of poly matrix actually allows to reconstruct the phase, and this is actually something that that can be done experimentally. And uh, so let me just oops, show you this. Um, 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 list of experiments that could be useful in this context. Um, so the idea is that what one would have, would have to do is to simultaneously measure uh, the Berry phase with respect to the magnetic fields and the entanglement. So we need to measure two phases, the Berry phase and the phase between the two entangled qubits. Okay, so, and these are different and this is, this is the, the key point here actually. And um, so this involves the interference between the original and the rotated state uh, for, uh, for an, an ensemble of identical quantum states. Now here on this list, uh, um, I have, so the hydrogen atom in the magnetic field is the example that we consider above. And uh, so here there's a lot of uh, possibilities for, for actually doing um, these um, uh, phase and entanglement measurements between qubits. Uh, but the, the non trivial step which has to be taken here on top of this um, is to combine this with a very phase measurement. Okay, so that would be the new aspect. And uh, so let me just go through the list. Um, oh, there's a B missing here. So could multi spin qubits are accessible in liquid state NMR or in quantum dots coupled to optical cavities. Um, there's also very nice measurements for superconducting quantum circuits. And also, um, I would like to point on this very nice review on quantum simulators uh, that also uh, aims at realizing experimentally some aspects of the ADS-CFT correspondence, but it's a bit uh, complementary to what I'm telling you here. It's more about teleportation and actually um, uh, travel, uh, not traversable one wormholes, yeah. Okay, there's another question, maybe quick, because I have still many things to say. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, so uh, when you are saying that you're rotating the states uh, mm -hmm. in, in the Berry phase, uh, in order to get the Berry phase, mm -hmm. how, how is the exact mechanism of doing that? Right, I mean, okay, it, that's it, just it, the thing that, that needs to be worked out. Okay, so, so it's an excellent question, and, and my honest answer, I don't know yet, <laughs> okay. And, and that's, that's just the, the, the question how to find a, a suitable experimental setup. Okay, so, and, and this is the thing that still needs to be done. You know, I, I, I don't know yet, but um, given that there's so much uh, research in this direction, I'm, I'm very confident that um, this can be found. And I, I'd be very happy to discuss with people who are experts in these measurements, how, how this could actually be. No, no, my concern is that the moment you try to rotate one of the states, Mm -hmm. uh, by doing some by doing some operation on it is going to collapse to some state and it's going to collapse the entire uh, uh, entangled state to some state and that means that uh, the other spin collapses to the opposite state of the first spin uh, well okay that's why i'm saying i mean there are these techniques of actually uh, identifying the entire density matrix and um, i i mean i i see your concern but um, okay i i would still be confident as there's, there's things that could be done okay uh, okay. But okay, I, I agree with you. That's certainly not easy to do, um, for sure. Um, uh, but um, you know, given that these techniques are well under control, I think. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Tore, for your message. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Tore Fosco writes that the rotation is unitary and there is no measurement yet. Okay. So. Uh, mm. In order to rotate, you have to uh, operate, you have to use some photons or something, right? I mean, in order to, you have to kick the system in some way. And that's going to collapse the system. Otherwise, how are you going to rotate it? Okay, I think maybe, let, can, can I go on? I, mean, yes, I think we should discuss this in detail at the end. I mean, it's, it's a very good question, but let, because I have okay. lots of other things I would like to say <laughs> before six, and then, and then we can keep going. I mean, but okay. it's a very good point. Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right, uh, good. Let me just uh, go on and um, um, get back to the wormholes a little bit. Okay, so um, now this can be all formulated in a rather mathematical approach um, by using um, 
um, um, the, the geometry of the two qubit Hilbert space, which in general, all generality is SU4. Um, so um, here, um, what we have um, is this uh, Hamiltonian including the Zeeman term, and then actually um, the, the remaining geometry is CP3, which is um, SU4 quotiented by, by U3. And okay, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of detail on these mathematical aspects, but let me just say that um, as long as we have two independent spins uh, without interaction, in particular, also if we switch off the, the magnetic field, um, then um, we have actually, we can write each of these spins in, in, these, um, in this CP1 language with uh, some complex variables here, okay? And um, so then we have uh, two single qubit subspaces inside uh, the CP3 space. And so we have clearly this factorized structure. So this is exactly what I was discussing for the wormholes. Um, so if we have two systems that are not talking to each other, uh, then um, we have a factored uh, Hilbert space, okay? And um, so these describe the local one-sided properties. But now the point is that in the presence of the Zeeman magnetic field, this tensor product structure will be broken. And in, in, instead of having this factored structure, we will have a non-factored structure similar to what is realized for the wormholes. And in particular, the ground state will be non -diagonally, in, in a non-diagonally embedded submanifold of this entire CP3 space. Okay, so rather than having just two red blobs inside our big Hilbert space, um, you know, there will really be a kind of bridge between them. And, and that's exactly what we expect for the, um, for the wormholes. Okay, and uh, so again, just to stick with the mathematical language, um, so, so CP3 is this closed set space um, SU4, which is the full Hilbert space and then quotient by U3. And actually the U1 inside the U3 defines a U1 bundle and um, so the point is that the, the SU4 generator associated with this bundle acts non-block non diagonally, and that leads precisely to this non-factorization. And um, so we can actually um, mathematically calculate the, the very curvature from, from uh, this connection in this particular, uh, defined on this particular bundle, and then it will agree exactly with the result that I showed you before. Okay, so, so it's really, um, a mathematical property of the Hilbert space. So there's non-factorization that you can also realize for just a simple system of two spins. And uh, the nice thing about this is that uh, that's a kind of defining property for a wormhole. And um, so this, the, what the statement I'm making here is that this can be also realized uh, very beautifully in such a simple quantum mechanical model. Okay, so to conclude, let me come to part three of my talk where I would like to look a little more at ADS3 uh, CFT2. And um, so that, that's the paper that we wrote uh, recently in February. And um, so what I'm uh, looking at here is um, uh, a very force for wormholes in this uh, three-dimensional antivisitor space. And um, so, but here again, the mathematical structure will be extremely similar um, to, to what I discussed before in the quantum mechanics system. And uh, so we benefited a lot from this paper by Mark Eno, Ward Mervis, and Ranschbar uh, from um, a little more than two years ago, uh, who already discussed this uh, geometry and also the, the mathematical structure in, in some detail. And so we found this as a very nice realization of this Barry phase concept. Um, in, in wormholes. Okay, so again, they look at uh, this uh, wormhole geometry that I introduced uh, at the beginning of the talk, again, with our horizon the similarities and the two CFTs on the two sides. Now, if you draw a slightly more pictorial representation of this, then you get this more kind of physical representation of our wormhole that you see in this plot here. And now if you just look from one side, Okay, if when you look through, say, the left um, throat, and then you see in the end, you see the other throat, and then basically the geometry which you have uh, looks like this. So, <clears throat> so I assume you look from this side, then S2 is uh, sigma 2 boundary is close to you, and the other one appears here inside. And then again, there's a non trivial winding number, there's a holonomy, uh, because I mean, if you now uh, calculate. Um, your integral along a path which wraps around this um, 
um, circle which encloses um, the other end of the, the other floor of the wormhole, and then you get actually a non-trivial homonomy here. And um, so that's actually um, in this paper, this was discussed in a very simple um, model where they just looked at the U1 uh, trans timings, so or they looked also at more, more complicated things. But the first um, example, which is actually very beautiful and very simple, is to look just at an abelian trans timings action on this three dimensional anti visitor space, as is written here mm -hmm, with level K. Yeah. Now, in the abelian case, um, the, the phi component of the, the gauge field, so the phi is the angle which takes you around here, um, uh, is actually a, a contribution which is kind of a pure gauge contribution. And then also, of course, the, the whole non homonomy contributes here. Um, and then, uh, as a standard for, for transcendence actions, you can actually trade your um, three dimensional transcendence action for um, some uh, boundary action. So, and so we can look at um, phi and psi, which are the boundary values of this uh, scalar mu here. Okay, so psi, uh, phi would be, say, on this boundary, and psi is on the other one. And then, using the transcendence actions and its equation of motion, including this holonomy. Oops. Then um, uh, one obtains the following action. Okay, we don't have to look at all the details. Uh, there's one action which includes the left boundary, which fields the boundary values on the left boundary, and then there's one action for the right boundary, with um, the field boundary field values on the right boundary. But then there's a term coupling the two, and that involves this homonomy. Okay, so K zero is all homonomy, and uh, this is actually now I deny I. I a dynamical um, quantity here, uh, which arises in this action. And now we can proceed exactly as before and, and calculate the symplectic form for this um, mechanical model. And for that, we have to evaluate the conjugate momentum for the homonomy, and, um, and this is, can be done by using again using the action. Um, so then um, the conjugate momentum looks like this, and um, this can be written in this form here. So um, essentially, this gives rise to, to a, again, a Wilson line uh, that connects the two boundaries. So very similar to these Wilson lines that I've been drawing before, these blue and red lines. And uh, <coughs> so given this conjugate momentum, we can now write the symplectic form on the boundary phase space. Which is spanned by uh, phi and psi, the, the fields at the boundary, and the homonomy, which connects the two, and then the, the con uh, conjugate momentum for these three things. And okay, so the, the total symplectic form uh, then takes this particular form. And it can be shown that uh, without this term, it's actually exact and the very phase is zero. However, if this holonomy enters, um, then we have this again, this uh, non uh, exact symplectic form. And uh, it's precisely the holonomy which contributes this non exact part. Um, so we have a, you know, this is a calculation for a wormhole, but it gives us exactly the same mathematical structure as we were discussing for the quantum mechanical models beforehand. Oops, sorry, that was. Why did I do that? Okay. But can you. I pushed the wrong. So can you see my screen again? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry about this. Okay. Now uh, we can set this. Uh, remember that the, um, the the gauge field um, actually contains the gauge contribution and the holonomy. So by a particular gauge choice uh, on, on on the boundaries, we can we can actually compensate for the holonomy and set this to zero. And so we can actually set the holonomy to, to be zero by a gauge choice. And then again, the, the Hilbert space factorizes uh, again. So we go from this factorized wormhole-like, uh, non-factorized uh, wormhole-like we Hilbert space to again, uh, a factorized one. And um, um, so, but at the same time, we have to pick a particular gauge in that case. And then the, the gauge freedom of the boundary fields is fixed. Okay, so um, this is just this very simple example where we do this for um, for the U1 um, abelian transcendence case. 
But now, um, actually, in the paper, if, so I, if you would like to see more details and more relations to ADS-CFT, I recommend to look at our paper um, where we actually performed a very similar analysis uh, for a non-abelian SO2R times SO2R symmetry, and that so then corresponds to the to the Virasoro uh, group, and um, so there's something called the Virasoro uh, Berry phase. Uh, where, where the symmetry transformations um, uh, amounts to changes of states in the, in the conformal field theories involved. And then there's a very beautiful mathematical story here, which I don't have time to explain now, but I very much recommend to you. So then the symplectic form on the phase space that I showed you on the previous slide can be mapped to a symplectic form on the Virasoro group manifold and with a coupling between the both CFTs. So we really see that, again, this holonomy provides precisely this coupling uh, that we saw before in the simple quantum mechanics model. Uh, let me just advertise that there's also uh, different uh, quite, um, types of Berry phases, apart from this uh, Virazo Berry phase, there's also a so-called gauge Berry phase, uh, which amounts to time translations of the two boundaries. So um, this time evolution is actually a, a symmetry of the wormhole and uh, but um, so um, we recall that at the beginning I said that there was this jump in the timeline killing vector, which again, this will lead to a non-exact symplectic form. And, and so that leads to another type of uh, non-trivial uh, berry phase here. Um, so, and there's also something called the modular berry phase. So if you want to know about all these things, I please do look at the very nice work, especially of our PhD students. Good, so that brings me to the end. So uh, what I showed to you is that um, the non-factorization of the of wormhole Hilbert spaces is due, uh, at least in this ADS context, is due to the non-exact um, symplectic form, um, which results in a, in a non-zero Berry phase. So, and the same mathematical structure is also present in, in the quantum mechanics models. Okay, I think somebody at some point asked, so what are you integrating over? Well, I mean, in this quantum mechanics model, I showed to you that instead of just having two separate Hilbert spaces, now they, they may kind of become bridged. And then so, so in that sense, um, this was actually meant. And so this um, further substantializes this really beautiful relation between entanglement and geometry that is realized in the ads cft correspondence and, and it brings it to a quite different context also to, to more quantum mechanical. Uh, questions and and that opens new possibilities for for experimental studies. I would be really interested to see if um, this can actually be seen experimentally. You know, as I said, it's I mean it's more complicated than what people have already done. But given that there's so many techniques, I'm quite confident that this will be possible. All right, so that brings me to the end, and I would like to thank you very much um, for your uh, patience, your interest, and I'm looking forward to further questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johanna. And I think we didn't see your last slide with the conclusion because I know that there was, uh, but at least I don't, I didn't see it, but it's fine. You didn't and, see it. Can you see it now? Uh, now, yes, yes, I didn't. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay so are there other questions or, um, or comments? Uh, please raise your hand. Yes, there is a question by Zeyna. I don't see you anymore, but please unmute. We can't hear you, unfortunately. You have to unmute yourself. Unmute, yes. I am asking you to unmute, but uh, OK. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not so well. Can you? OK, I will speak louder. Could you? Yes and no, but go ahead. We will try to understand. <laughs> Okay, so I will uh, increase the volume of computer, so maybe... No, no, the volume is okay. Maybe the connection, but go ahead. Okay, uh, so um, thank you very much for your uh, very beautiful talk. Uh, my question is a little bit uh, fantasy. Uh, so you mentioned the relation with the entanglement and geometry. Uh, so I want to understand the, the relation between uh, sentiment and black hole. So you said that Einstein was trying to say when two photons are entangled, so the Einstein's relativity, special relativity can be violated. But uh, 
of course, till now, uh, this uh, uh, idea by Einstein is not proven. And uh, uh, we know that uh, we, we have entanglement uh, with the violation the relativity of, 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 of Einstein. But um, I'm looking for uh, this violation in black hole. So if, uh, uh, for example, is it possible to have uh, this idea by Einstein in black hole? For, for, for example, something can be happened faster than, than C in black hole or in wormhole. So, uh, or maybe time travel can be happened. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, thank you for your nice question. Uh, I don't think we do that here because uh, I was very careful to emphasize that we look at these non-traversable wormholes, okay? So energy is everywhere conserved, okay? And um, we, I mean, so certainly um, observers can travel from here into the black hole and from there, in that sense, it's a wormhole, but uh, it's not possible to go back out again. Okay, so this is a classical non-radiating black hole in anti sitter space. Okay, and uh, so 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 there's no. Uh, I mean, you know, a traversable wormhole requires that for a short amount of time um, the energy conservation is uh, violated, okay. which is pos possible with uh, um, the um, um, the. Heisenberg uncertainty relation, but I'm not considering this here. I'm just looking at classical geometries. So, so I, I don't think any so causality or, or um, general relativity or special relativity are, are not violated at all in what I did. Um, I mean, of course, it's an interesting question to ask what would happen if you do it, but I mean, th this wasn't not at all what I had in mind here. I, wa I was trying to do something much more simple and um, so that in that sense, I, I'm afraid it will not very much have your question. But, Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for the nice question. Thank you. We have a question from Michael Berry. So that's great to have you. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Um, hello. Uh, thanks for being here. Th thank you very much for this talk. It, I was attracted by the title. It's a subject which I know almost nothing about, the context, I, I mean. But it, it did resonate with something I've been emphasizing recently when uh, speaking about geometric phases. And my question when I've explained this resonance will be, uh, does this make sense? And what I've been emphasizing is that there is a sense in which Geometric phases are artifacts. They are artifacts of our decision to separate a system which has interacting parts and consider the parts to, in some, to some extent uh, separately. What I mean is this. You think of the geometric phase in its simplest form as an effect of parameters which can depend on time on a system. But of course, the parameters are quantum themselves as uh, everything is and uh, if we would consider the complete system which consists of uh, uh, whatever system the parameters uh, 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 determined by and uh, the system they're acting on then one can understand everything at least in principle without ever considering geometric phases the context uh, which is most familiar is quantum chemistry where uh, you want, you have a molecule, it's hard to calculate uh, er, er, the full quantum mechanics, but uh, you think of the nuclei as being slow and say how they their positions constitute parameters uh, uh, which hardly change while the electrons solve their Schrodinger equation. Now, sometimes when you have degeneracies, uh, for certain uh, uh, circuits in the nuclear position space, the electrons have geometric phases. Uh, but that means that if you would consider the nuclear uh, quantum mechanics, when you do, you have to consider this geometric phase, uh, it, rather it's opposite uh, in when you quantize the nuclear dynamics so that the total state of the system is single valued. And this has consequences. It's well understood in, 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 in quantum chemistry. But I think uh, what you have described uh, could be regarded as an example of this uh, uh, phenomenon uh, where you're beginning to take uh, seriously 
the effect of the phase on of one part of the system uh, on, uh, on, uh, 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 on the other part. Now, very often in physics, of course, uh, uh, you don't need to consider the dynamics of the parameters. If it's some big piece of apparatus that you're using to create magnetic fields to, to control neutrons, for example, to see their geometric phases, the solid angle business, you would never want to quantize that big piece of apparatus. But in some cases, and maybe your case too, um, uh, you do want to uh, uh, consider the whole system. And uh, then if you do something which is essentially unquantum, which is you don't consider the holism, which we know really underlies quantum physics, uh, then uh, the geometric phase is introduced. And in a sense, you have to cancel it by uh, uh, when, when you want to take the, the separation, which is indeed a kind of entanglement more seriously. Now, does this make sense? Uh, okay, thank you very much for your very nice comment. I, I'm, I think yes, and I'm, I'm just trying to think to, to make sense of it. I think what you are referring to, let me see if I can approach your reasoning from, from my side. So what, what you have in mind is, so why are you, you are saying separating? Because we look at this particular model where only one spin interacts with the magnetic field and not yeah, the other. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, Yes, I mean, I have to say, I mean, of course, we started from a completely different direction, but maybe we will reach the point that you were just describing. So for, for us, this was just a, a matter of, of simplicity to have a model where, um, you know, just one of the spin interacts, because that simplifies a lot of the computations. Um, so um, I think what I've been dwelling on quite a bit, and probably I hope this connects with what you were just saying, um, that, I mean, we somehow need this geometrical object for creating this uh, non-exact symplectic form, mm. which then leads to the non-vanishing phase, geometric mm -hmm. form. And um, so, so the magnetic field um, is, in the con I mean, comparing to the wormhole, it, it connects to the fact but um, you know there's some singularity. Like in the, for the wormhole, there's you know time just jumps up the horizon, so that's a singularity, and that creates this particular phase. And on, on uh, for the quantum mechanics model, it's precisely this magnetic field that we need to to create a similar uh, singularity in in the symplectic form to to create the, the a non-vanishing phase. So what we see, and maybe that's a bit different from what you had in mind, um, that as it comes to the quantized states, the Berry phase is non-zero once we connect things, but once they are not entangled, you know, and they don't talk to each other, in that case, the phase actually vanishes. Yes, yes, good. That makes sense. That makes sense. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so in that sense, so so did you publish this recently? Would you just well, I wrote about it in a, in a in, in an article for an encyclopedia edited by Frank Wilczek, which uh, seems to be a frozen project. So it's it's oh, his okay. principle. So I so uh, I, I did, but uh, I often speak about it when I speak about geometric phases. Yeah. But uh, uh, I, as I say, it's uh, it, I was very pleased to write it, but the, the project seems to be frozen. I don't oh, know. that's a shame. I would definitely love to, to read about it. So once it becomes available, please let me know. And that will be thank you very much. Yeah, yes, thank good. you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I I quickly ask for further comments. Um, but I guess we had a lot of questions and a very interesting discussion. So I leave the uh, uh, yeah, uh, Tanya, uh, if you want to say bye. <laughs> yes, sure, yeah. sure. I want to say, but there is another question or not? Oh, sorry, question, sorry yeah. I didn't see it. Yeah, You're yeah. right. Ah, okay. Now, in fact, I was. Yes, please. I mean, there's another Two question. Two other questions. Very good. Two other questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it was short. First, there's some data. Yeah, so my question is like uh, the when you're saying that you have this berry phase in a, in a, uh, when you're writing the symplectic form, uh, you have to invoke some extra dimensions also. I mean, some one extra dimension, right? When you're, when you're writing the berry phase in terms of the symplectic yeah. form, so is that is that extra dimension to be thought of as as the bulk uh, in the holographic dictionary, or it's a totally different thing, or are they related? 
uh, okay, I mean, okay, that's a very general question. I mean, I don't think they're related. Uh, I mean, of course, in, in ABS CFT, we have, uh, um, you know, we have uh, one dimension higher, but then I, I essentially, then when I compared to the, the field theory, I was talking about the boundary values again of these fields. And it's true that the holonomy in the higher dimensional space then provides a connection between these uh, two previously unrelated quantum field theories at the boundary. But um, I think the, the di extra dimension that you have in mind uh, can also be real realized in quite different ways. I mean, um, it's not necessarily always th this one, yeah. But there's no relationship also between the two, right? Yeah, in this case, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, there, somebody, Luca, talked, uh, typed it. I mean, Luca, yes. can you talk or should I should just read your question? You can also speak. Uh, otherwise, oh. yeah, Luca. Oh, okay. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, essentially, I will uh, repeat the question again, probably trying to explain better. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if I got the example you gave yeah. for the uh, two qubit case, right? Because you said, okay, we take this Hamiltonian, we perform this rotation, and, um, and okay, I probably got the point, but I, I would say that one could say, that uh, any state of the system is an element of the tensor product of the two qubit Hilbert space or the single qubit Hilbert space, right? And uh, I don't see the relation with the Hamiltonian or even the simplectic structure you are putting in that space. Okay, okay, so it, it's true um, that we have, um, we have, Two different things. Okay, so so the one is we have two interacting spins. So so okay, let me quickly show my uh, my, my um, Hamiltonian again. That's a very good question. Um, okay, let me just find the Hamiltonian one more time. Um, okay, here's the Hamiltonian. Okay, so first of all, it's actually crucial that the two spins interact with each other. I mean, otherwise we, you know. Um, that, that's exactly the same as for the black hole. I mean, if there's no interaction between the two, then th nothing is going to happen. Then it's definitely true that we have two different phases. We have the, the very phase, which is just the rotation around, um, um, you know, which is the phase with respect to this magnetic field. And um, so then what we uh, study here is um, somehow the interrelation between the phase, which comes from, um, from these unitary rotations here, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, so which enter this uh, entanglement entropy, and the Berry phase, okay, and um, so as far as the entanglement is concerned, I mean entanglement entropy you can only define if you have two spins, <laughs> okay. So so then the statement is that the entanglement entropy actually. Uh, is invariant under these symmetry uh, tree transformations that I defined. Mm -hmm. While nevertheless, um, the 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 Berry phase of these state changes. Okay, um, so the entanglement entropy. So it, it just means you can have states that have different Berry phase but the same entanglement entropy. I see. Okay, and and that's the new thing which you can only have if you have at the same time entanglement and the very and yeah and this magnetic field okay so so it's really both terms in this Hamiltonian are absolutely crucial if you know if there's no entanglement everything is totally understood and well known okay so the new thing is to ask you know what happens to entanglement uh, once um, um, once I, I know for these unitary transformations and okay so the statement is the the entanglement shouldn't change, but nevertheless, the Berry phase changes. And I think that could also be very interesting for measurements. You know, if you have two states yes. that have different Berry phase, but nevertheless, they have the same entanglement entropy. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe this is actually something that could be seen. And, and, and then, I mean, this is a feature that also actually arises for, for the wormholes. So, so I think it's a very interesting connection. 
so 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 that was the point of having entanglement at the same time as at the very face with respect to the magnetic field. Now, of course, you know, an, an absolutely excellent question that you're raising, and you know, we didn't think about this yet, is of course you can also define very phases with respect uh, of the two spins with respect to each other. You know, it's a a very phase uh, with respect to one spin essentially rotating around the other, if you want. That could also lead to other interesting questions which we haven't considered yet. So here we really, you know, so the point was that you know this singularity in the symplectic form gives rise to this non-factorized structure of the Hilbert space, and here so we need something that creates this non-factorized structure. In this case, it's the magnetic field. And then we look at the feature of the entanglement in this background, but um, okay, maybe there's even also a phase which we can calculate it just for this um, for related to the, the the entanglement of the two fields. But that would be a different thing which we didn't consider yet. Okay, thank you. We'll think about it. Uh, yeah, thank so very much. thanks for the very good question. <laughs> there is another hand raise, Kiran. You can talk. Okay, so thank you. So thank you for the very interesting talk. And uh, so I, I guess like my question is quite general. So I think in this talk you saw that the berry phase, which is quite a non-trivial effect, has some effect in the bulk. Like, so do we expect that uh, any, uh, like, do we expect all the quantum effects in the boundary to have a bulk effect? Like for example, superpositions or like any quantum effects to have this, uh, to have the some to have similarities in the bulk as well. I mean, uh, entanglement is question. just yeah. Okay, excellent question, and uh, you know this is something really to look at in the future. And um, I think there's many things which are waiting to be explored. Okay, so I mean here we were just taking a kind of minimal step. Okay, so there. <laughs> the, the 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 step was that um, you know a connection by some wormhole geometry is equivalent to having some entanglement okay so and then we were just thinking of how to realize such a connection also in a quantum mechanical system now okay here i think we were quite successful but then you, you can of course as you're just doing we can ask many other questions you know are there other quantum effects uh, that we should be re see realized in the wormhole geometry and um that's a very good question, but I think at the moment we were just happy to see this relation between geometry and entanglement, which is already, you know, rather fundamental. <laughs> but uh, of course, uh, I mean, you can imagine many other things that we would like to see, but um, okay. I think um, there's a lot of room to for things to be explored in the future. Right? All right. Um, I don't see any other uh, raised hands so <laughs> <laughs> it was long discussion very nice so maybe again uh, if there is nothing uh, that i missed uh, i leave the i leave thank you yeah and uh, i just want to thank really thank joanna because uh, of her uh, uh, disponibility to to answer all the question the, the, the discussion was very very interesting and also if you look at the chat there are a lot of thanks for your clarity for your uh, beautiful talk so uh, i really thank you the slides uh, will be published soon and also the video of this uh, uh, seminar and uh, people who will uh, uh, profit for video and slides when when they want on our web page so really thank you and yes, uh, thank all the participants and all the organizers for this beautiful uh, evening and uh, talk. Thank you very much. Have yes, nice. thank you very much for having me. It was a break. Thank you. Talk to you. Thanks for the nice discussion. And yeah. The yeah. I hope to see you, you again you. soon. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, bye. 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 Yeah, it was good yeah. to see you. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, yeah, thank thanks. you very much. Yeah, good to see thank you. Me. Thanks. Yeah, see you soon. Bye bye. Thank see you. you. See you soon. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye.